Hello, uh, my name is Graham Voss and I'm the Acting Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences. I'm speaking to you today from the University of Victoria and I would like to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the University stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. I feel very privileged to live and work in this beautiful place and I hope you can take a moment to reflect on the place where you live and with whom it is shared. My role is to introduce our speaker for this contribution to the Dean's Lecture Series. Our speaker is Dr. Randy Sharayan, and the topic is Space-Based Observations of the Rapidly Changing Arctic Ocean. Dr. Randy Sharayan is an Associate Professor in Remote Sensing in the Department of Geography at the University of Victoria. His research focuses on the application of satellite remote sensing for studying Arctic sea ice and related marine ecosystem variability and hazards. He has over 15 years experience conducting field research associated with sea ice remote sensing in the Canadian and European Arctic and Antarctica. He regularly works with major governmental agencies and the, on the development of scientific and operational sea ice monitoring tools and partners with coastal communities in the Western Canadian Arctic to promote the use of modern technologies for safe and informed sea ice use. He is currently serving as a science team member for the Canadian Terrestrial Snow Mass Mission a satellite mission designed to significantly enhance Canada's capacity to manage its water resources and participating in Mosaic, a year-long ship-based Arctic climate project that is unprecedented in size. I very much hope you enjoy Randy's talk today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Randy Shrine and welcome to my talk called Space-Based Observations of the Rapidly Changing Arctic Ocean. A little bit about me, I'm an associate professor here at University of Victoria my specialization is in remote sensing, geophysics, and especially sea ice. Before coming to the University of Victoria, I was a European Space Agency Changing Earth Science Network investigator with a specialization in oceans and climate. And I did my PhD at the University of Calgary in the microwave remote sensing of sea ice. Uh, the outline of today's talk, I'll start by answering the question, why space? And then I'll look at sea ice decline in the Arctic and then we'll look at selected impacts on ocean and ecology with an emphasis on satellite remote sensing in line with today's talk theme. And lastly, I'll look at human risk in the Arctic as it's related to changes in sea ice conditions. So why space? Well, we're interested here in the Arctic Ocean, which is a very large place. It's 14 million square kilometers, so about 14 times the size of British Columbia and it encapsulates the area from 60 degrees north to the North Pole. So it's a very large area that we need to cover when we're interested in monitoring it and understanding what's taking place there. It's also a very extreme environment. There's sea ice on the ocean, of course, because sea ice is the frozen ocean. It's a very cold place as well. A mean temperature of minus 40 degrees at the North Pole in wintertime gives you some idea of, about what we're looking at in terms of the extremes on the cold end of the spectrum. In the summer, it doesn't get a lot warmer. It does have a mean temperature of about zero degrees Celsius. It's dark for six months of the year, and it's also a very inaccessible place. So our story about space-based observations of the Arctic Ocean really begins with the launch of weather satellites, and in particular, a satellite called Nimbus 7 that was launched in 1978. It was a multi-sensor research platform, meaning it had a number of instruments on a single platform, and it was launched by NASA. It had a polar orbit, which means it orbited over the polar regions, and it could cover the Earth in a single orbit in about 1.5 hours. And there's a, a sensor on that um, satellite that we're very interested in, in the context of today's talk, and that's called the SMMR, which is a microwave radiometer sensor. And this was the first in a series of scanning microwave radiometers that continues to this day. Now, a little bit about satellite remote sensing. Generally speaking, it can be passive or it can be active. Passive remote sensing is when we're measuring energy that's naturally emitted by an object. And then we infer some information about that object. Active remote sensing, on the other hand, is when we direct energy at an object and then we measure what returns to the sensor from the object. And we use that information to infer some information about the object. And that can be much more than a photograph. In this case, we can use signals in parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that are well beyond what our eyes are, are capable of seeing. And just to look at three general remote sensing modes here, uh, you can measure reflected solar radiation with a satellite. So this is a passive form of remote sensing. You can also measure energy that's been absorbed by the Earth's surface and then is re-radiated 
as thermal energy, and this is also passive. And then the third mode of remote sensing, as I mentioned previously, you can, uh, you can transmit energy towards the Earth's surface and then measure what comes back to the sensor. Now in passive microwave remote sensing, we're interested in microwaves, which are very long wavelength waves that are naturally emitted by the Earth's surface. In fact, any object that's above absolute zero will emit some microwave energy. So on the left-hand side of, of the chart that's given there, you'll see microwaves are waves that are about one millimeter to about 10 centimeters long in wavelength. And these are much longer than visible wavelengths, which are those portions of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes are sensitive to. And you can see that the visible portion is actually a very small portion of the larger electromagnetic spectrum. And what that means is that there's actually a lot more energy out there that we can measure and use to form imagery in a remote sensing context than what our eyes can detect. Now the benefits of passive microwave remote sensing in the context of today's talk is that we have a long-term data record beginning about 1978 with the launch of SMMR. Uh, sunlight's not needed to form an image. We're measuring microwaves, so we don't actually need the direct sunlight. This is energy that's being naturally emitted. We can consider that to be background energy that's there regardless of whether the sun is present at a particular point in time. Microwave energy passes freely through clouds in most weather, and that's because it's long wavelength energy. And long wavelength energy tends to pass through barriers uh, without uh, interacting with those barriers. Some drawbacks here, well, natural microwave energy emission is low, so we actually have to collect the energy over very large areas so that we can build up a strong enough signal so that we can actually understand something about the microwave energy that's being directed uh, naturally towards a, a satellite in this case that would be passing overhead. So we are not able to resolve small scale details, but we can monitor areas like the Arctic Ocean using this type of energy. Uh, just to look at a sensor, just one example of a, of a sensor that fits within this continuing legacy of microwave sensors that began in 1978. This is a sensor that was uh, present from 2002 to 2011. And I want to highlight a couple of things that we see in this slide. For instance, the swath. The swath is 1,445 kilometers, and that means that when the satellite passes over the Earth's surface, it's actually scanning uh, a swath or a, a width that's 1,445 kilometers wide. So it's a very large portion of the Earth's surface that's covered just by one scan of the satellite as it passes overhead. The table below is just for reference, uh, but what that's telling us is that there are actually a number of frequency bands or a number of portions of the electromagnetic spectrum within the microwave region that we're sensing. There are various polarizations, which just means that we filter out the radiation so that it has a particular orientation, and that gives us a much clearer signal of the Earth's surface. Much like when you put on polarized sunglasses, you get a much clearer view of, of the world around you. Uh, there's a spatial resolution that varies there according to the microwave uh, frequency. That's just basically giving us an idea of what sort of detail we can resolve in a single image. So for example, 74 kilometers by 43 kilometers is a very large area. If you imagine focusing on your television screen down to the point where you see one pixel element or one resolution cell, that would be a very, very tiny and detailed resolution cell. Well, in this case, it would be 74 kilometers by 43 kilometers. So very large in this particular case. What this does offer us, though, is the ability to provide coverage of the Arctic regions and almost the entire globe in one day. So if we flattened out the globe and looked at what swath coverage we would get from a passive microwave remote sensing sensor, it would look something like this. And if we added some color to the microwave energy that we receive, then we get a nice color map here that gives us a nice detailed information about what type of radiation in the microwave portion of the spectrum is actually coming from the Earth's surface at a given point in time. And what that's enabled us to do then is take a very broad look at the Earth's surface. In this case, we're looking at the Arctic region, and we can see the area of the Arctic region that's covered by sea ice, and we can see the surrounding ocean and also the surrounding land masses. Now, this isn't an image of microwave energy. What this is is a visualization that's been developed from the microwave energy that's been recorded by a satellite sensor like SMMR.
In this particular case, it was a measurement that was taken on September 13th in 2012. And what this is highlighting is a minimum coverage of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. So at the end of summer, it's been a relatively warm summer in an Arctic context, and the ice has melted down to its minimum extent, and we're having a, a view of where the ice is actually remaining at that point in time. Conversely, we can look at the maximum extent of Arctic sea ice coverage, which typically takes place in around late February or early March. So we call this the maximum extent period. And in this case, we're seeing a coverage of about 15 million square kilometers. So it's actually covering a larger area than what we consider to be the Arctic Ocean. And that's because sea ice can actually cover portions of the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean as well. So we do have a very good understanding of the coverage of sea ice in the Arctic uh, because of the, the ability to form imagery from microwave energy. And we know that sea ice covers about 12% of the world's oceans, so that includes the Arctic and the Antarctic region. It undergoes significant yearly cycling. So from a climate perspective, that's interesting because we see this coverage of a white veneer of sea ice that annually grows to, in the Arctic case, about 16 million square kilometers and then shrinks down to a minimum extent of 7 million square kilometers. Those are very general numbers. Um, the, we, we'll see that there is actually quite a lot of variability in those numbers over the measurement period that we've uh, been able to um, record since 1978. Sea ice is actually quite dynamic as well too. We think of it as a, as a single white uh, substrate that, that covers the Arctic Ocean. Uh, it can actually be quite uh, colorful and dynamic. In this case here, we're looking at sea ice that's just starting to form adjacent to a research vessel. And we can see that it's thin and we can actually see the ocean underneath it as well too. It can be quite uh, spatially variable as well. These are ice flows that are actually called pancake ice, uh, and, that, and that's what they look like. And in this case, this is ice that's formed and also been roughened by the orbital motion of waves on the ocean surface so that the ice that's forming starts to collide against itself and breaks apart into circular flows that uh, formed sort of rid ridged edges that look like pancakes, so very interesting features. Um, this may be what we, we would imagine a sea ice cover to be, a consolidated thick layer of, of ice that's, uh, that, that's adjacent to an open ocean. So in this case, this is ice that's uh, grown to close to its seasonal maximum extent and you can see the open ocean adjacent to it. It can actually be quite dynamic during the melting season as well too. If you were to fly over sea ice, this is a photograph taken from an airplane. We can see that there's actually a bluish tint to the sea ice, and that's melt water that's actually pooling on top of the ice while the snow on the ice surface melts, but the water has nowhere else to go but to sit on top of the ice that's frozen underneath it. Now, measuring sea ice using microwave energy uh, involves the collection of the natural microwave radiation, as I mentioned before. Now, there is radiation from the ocean and radiation from sea ice as well. And that can be collected in one single acquisition by the sensor. So in that case, we actually try to unmix what we call a sea ice concentration. So the relative concentration of ocean and sea ice within a single pixel element or resolution cell in our microwave image. Once we have that measurement, and it's called a brightness temperature because it's very much connected to the, the temperature of, of the object that's emitting the energy. So you can think of a warmer object emitting more microwave energy, and that's what's happening in this case. We can actually interpolate the measured brightness temperatures of pure surface types, ocean and sea ice, in order to unmix a concentration of sea ice in an area from the passive microwave uh, information that we collect. If we take the sea ice concentration and we define the ice area in the Arctic as the area of ocean that has at least 15% sea ice concentration or greater, then we can piece together a map like you see on the left there, which shows the extent of sea ice that's covering the Arctic at a given point in time. And with passive microwave energy, we can do that on a daily basis. So this is just an example of a sea ice extent map taken on the 2nd of December 2020, so not very long ago. And we're looking at the extent compared to what we would expect in, in a median condition based on what we've measured from 1981 to 2010. So we can see, for example, if we look at the northern Atlantic Ocean uh, adjacent to Greenland, we can see that there's less ice at that particular moment in time compared to what we would expect in median conditions or average conditions, if you will. <laughs> 
Now, as I mentioned, we've been able to take measurements since 1978. Uh, our season in, a, in an Arctic seasonal context began in 1979, once we had enough measurements to build up uh, to, to look at a time series in, in sea ice extent. And what we're seeing is a dramatic decline, in particular in the September minimum sea ice extent. So the figure that you're looking at here, uh, the, the graphic, if you will, uh, it shows a time series that's actually a single season from about July through to about November. And on the y-axis, we see the extent of sea ice in millions of square kilometers. So what we're seeing is the annual melt of sea ice from close to its maximum extent down to its minimum extent. And then at about October, it starts to grow again towards its maximum extent uh, in the subsequent season. Now, when we started taking these measurements, we saw that while well, we were generally above average in terms of conditions, we had more ice than uh, early in the time series compared to what we had now. It was, as we start to move towards more recent decades, what you see there in the blues and the pinks are years of sea ice extent that are much below the, the average conditions, uh, in, in this case, well below the average conditions, and consistently below the average conditions. So this is telling us that there is actually a dramatic decline in the September minimum in sea ice extent in the Arctic. Now, if we look at that in terms of the tallied minimums and maximums and sea ice extent on a seasonal basis, we're looking here at the September seasonal minimum extent over the time period that we've been recording those measurements, so since 1978. And we can see a steady decline there, a significant trend that is statistically significant. There are some years where we have a lower minimum sea ice extent and then uh, a higher, and that suggests some sort of recovery on a season to season basis. But the trend is quite clear there that the sea ice is declining, especially in the September minimum extent period. Now, if we look at the March seasonal maximum extent in sea ice, and look at the time series that we have available to us since 1978 and up to the present, we do also see a decline in sea ice and a significant trend in the sea ice loss as well too. Now it's not as significant or it, it's not as high as the, the, the loss that we get in September, uh, but it's certainly a significant declining trend. So if we look at the sea ice decline in, in terms of percent difference from 1978 to present, this gives us a better idea of how much ice cover is there at a particular time of year uh, compared to the ice that was there when we started measuring it when we launched our first weather satellites. We can see the slopes that are significant and it gives us an idea of the loss per decade. So in March we're seeing a loss of about 3% per decade and in the case of the September minimum sea ice extent we're losing about 13% of ice um, per decade as well too. So this is a significant loss in terms of uh, the ice cover in an area that's generally covered by a large amount of ice. So we start to see a situation uh, as we have in this uh, image that looks much like a photograph here. This is a true color image taken from a satellite. And a keen eye will tell you that what we're looking at here is the fabled Northwest Passage through northern Canada, above the conti continuous landmass of North America and in the islands called the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. And if you were uh, keen or uh, on, on exploration or had a knowledge of the Northwest Passage, you'd be able to trace from the left side of the photograph to the right side of the photograph, and you would see that the Northwest Passage is pretty much clear of ice when this image was taken, which was during the summertime near that September minimum in sea ice extent. So we now have a Northwest Passage that is clear and potentially navigable in this particular case. It's not like this every year, but in the year that this image was taken, it was certainly navigable. And that has motivated a change in shift, if you will, in, in, in the attitude that people have uh, towards tourism in the Arctic. And we actually had in 2016 our first major cruise through the Arctic, through the fabled Northwest Passage by the Crystal Serenity. And this marks a real shift in terms of uh, tourism and accessibility in the Arctic region. Now what's actually happening here? It's quite clear that there's a, a consistent signal in sea ice loss that's happening. Well, we link this to what's called the sea ice albedo feedback mechanism. And it's a positive feedback mechanism, which means once we have a perturbation like warming, 
that starts the feedback mechanism, and that mechanism starts to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And it's fairly straightforward in the Arctic case because we have a situation here where we have areas that were typically bright and had a high albedo. And albedo is reflectivity, which means that if the sun strikes that area, it's easily reflected back out to space so that you have sunlight and heating that's being lost from a given region just based on that albedo. If you remove that ice cover, then you have open ocean, which is like wearing a dark t-shirt in the summertime. You're going to absorb a lot of the solar radiation that strikes that t-shirt, or in this case, the open ocean, and not much of it is reflected back outwards, in this case, back out to space. It's instead absorbed into the water column so that that contributes to more and more warming. So our positive feedback mechanism here is the warming, the melting of sea ice, the exposure of ocean, and the increase in solar absorption, which seasonally means that we have areas of open water that, that are exposed earlier in the season because it's generally warmer, and they're open later in the fall as well too because of that warming. On an interannual basis, it means that there are areas of open water now where there used to be sea ice so that we have this solar radiation absorption taking place and we have a heating of the ocean that's taking place here. If we look at what air temperatures are like in the polar regions, well, in this case, looking at it globally, but uh, focusing on the northern regions at the top of the screen here, we can see that on an annual basis, in this case, comparing 2015, to 1980, just to give some idea in a time series context how temperatures are changing, we see that the most dramatic warming is occurring in the Arctic and that it's widespread as well to most of the Arctic region in this case is covered by the reddish tinge which is telling us that there's a warming of two degrees or greater in the region. We can also look at this on what we call a zonal basis, which just means that we're averaging based on latitude bands and looking globally at how the warming is taking place or, or cooling, if you will. So if we look at the x-axis here along the bottom of the screen, we're tracing from minus 90 degrees south, so the south pole, up to 90 degrees north, the north pole, and you can see that the latitude bands that are situated in the Arctic are experiencing the greatest warming as well. Again, about two degrees or higher when we compare conditions in 2015 to conditions in 1980. Just a seasonal perspective here uh, to, to provide some, some current context to the talk. We, we can look at air temperature anomalies in degrees Celsius for the season's autumn of 2019, winter of 2020, spring of 2020, and summer of 2020. So looking at how temperatures in those seasons compared to what we would consider a climatological mean, the average condition from 1981 to 2010. And generally speaking, the warming is widespread in the Arctic region. These figures are showing uh, an image of the Earth's surface as though you're looking down at the North Pole uh, in, into northern North America on the right-hand side of each one of those uh, circular uh, figures and Russia on the left-hand side of each one of those circular figures. So with the exception of perhaps winter 2020 where we do see some uh, relatively normal conditions and maybe perhaps even a little bit of cooling in the Arctic, all of the other seasons do show that there is widespread warming in the Arctic region and that it is two degrees or higher. With satellites uh, and these weather satellites that we've had available to us, we've been able to monitor the melt season length. Length. So looking at when the ice starts to melt in a given season and then when it starts to freeze up again at the end of the melt season, so when conditions are starting to get cold and, and the ice is starting to form again. With that, those data, we're able to look at trends, so the melt onset trend, so is it getting earlier and earlier? In this case it is, and that's on the left-hand side of this figure is freeze onset, so when things cool down, is that getting later? And in this case, we are seeing that things are getting uh, later in this context as well. So is the melt season length increasing? And uh, by looking at this figure, it's quite apparent that on the right-hand side there that we are seeing melt season lengths uh, increasing quite considerably. In terms of days per decade, uh, based on this data set, we're seeing a longer melt season of about 20 days or so. Uh, obviously there is a lot of spatial variability within the region, but the link, melt season length increase is widespread. We've been able to track the age of sea ice with satellites as well too. So that's answering the question, how old is the sea ice in the Arctic? And if we have an idea of how old the sea ice is in the Arctic in a particular area, then we have a good idea about how thick the ice is in the, in the Arctic in that given area. And that's because older ice is thicker 
As the ice gets older, it grows thicker and thicker over the, the cold seasons so that we see ice that's maybe beyond three meters thick and, and towards three, four, and five meters thick. And that's usually within that, that window of, of ice that's three to four or greater than four years older in the Arctic. Now, if we compare conditions in 1985 when this particular satellite data record began, we can see that sea ice that was older than four years made up about 20% of the Arctic region. But if we compare that to 2015, we see that the older sea ice is only about, 50, or pardon me, about 5% of the Arctic region. And the decline there as a function of the age of sea ice is apparent on the figure in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Sea ice thickness. I'm often asked the question, well, can we just measure how thick the ice is so that we have an understanding of whether or not uh, it, we're, we're losing the ice, if you will, or if it's declining in the, in the context of thickness or volume. We can't actually measure sea ice thickness from space, but we can infer the thickness of sea ice from space. And we do this based on what's called the, the freeboard technique. And that's where we have a laser or radar altimeter. So laser uses light, a radar uses microwave energy, but the altimeter principle is the same regardless of whether it's laser or radar. And we simply bounce a signal off the ocean surface and then bounce a signal off the sea ice surface. And we take the difference in time, or we convert that difference in time to a difference in, in, in length, and we take that length difference and we have a measurement of the ice freeboard, which is the amount the ice is floating above the ocean surface. And based on some very simple physical principles, where we just need to know the density of the water and the density of the ice and the freeboard, we can then estimate the sea ice thickness for a particular area where we've taken those measurements. So in this case, we have an assumption that the density of water is about 1,000 kilograms per meter cube, and that's pretty close to reality, and that's fairly consistent. We also have a, an estimate of the density of the ice, 850 kilograms per meter cube. Now, that's not always consistently the case. The density of sea ice can vary, but we have to make an assumption here, and in this case, the assumption usually is that the ice is 850 kilograms per meter cube. So we have those fixed uh, values, and if we have a, a freeboard measurement, we can infer the thickness of the ice. We need to do this during the winter season. If the ice is melting, then melting conditions can confuse that signal quite considerably. But what we do is we stitch together multiple overpasses by the satellite during the winter period, perhaps once per month, maybe once per week or a couple of weeks. And we can see observations from October through to about April before melting conditions start. And we have an estimate of the sea ice thickness for regions in the Arctic. And they, an, a map of those sea ice thickness estimates would look like what you see on the left-hand portion of the screen. What we're interested in doing is looking at how the growth of the sea ice evolves over the winter season and how thick the ice gets over the winter season. And that's as good as, as this technique can get. Uh, we can't see how thick the ice is during that September minimum sea ice extent when we know that the area of ice that covers the Arctic has shrunk to its minimum. But we can at least look to see how the ice grows in a particular melt season. So that would be the top of each one of these uh, linear portions of this time series plot that's shown here that's been created from two different satellites, one called Envisat and one called Cryosat. And together, those two satellites have been in orbit since 2003. So we're seeing a growth of sea ice from about a meter when we start to take those measurements in a given season, sometimes a little bit below a meter and growth to about two meters to two meters plus. So that's an average for the entire Arctic basin, uh, regardless of, of where you're located. So it gives us some idea of how much mass of ice is actually remaining in a given area. So that allows us to create maps like you see here. If we take the time series and we create an average condition, we were then able to look at spatial and temporal anomalies, we call them. So how thick the ice is in a given area and a given point in time relative to the average conditions that we've collected based on the satellite data records that we have available to us. So this is just to highlight that we do have a lot of thickness anomalies. We have regions where we see the ice is getting thinner and thinner. And in a particular season, in this case, we're looking at the winter period that starts in late October 2017 and runs to March of 2018 there. And we can see that there are some regions, if you're familiar with the Beaufort region north of Alaska, for example, in this particular case, that's an area where we see that there is a lot of thinning relative to average conditions. Now, the ice extent is declining. Melt season lengths are increasing. 
of there isn't absolute certainty over the thickness of ice. We see some variability season to season and place to place. But we do know that that change in Arctic sea ice extent is having some impacts on ocean and ecology. And I want to highlight four main areas where we do see impacts. Sea surface temperature, biology, primary productivity, and tundra, which of course isn't an ocean phenomenon, but it, in this case we'll look at tundra that's adjacent to the ocean. Sea surface temperature, as you could well imagine, if we have less sea ice in the area because of the sea ice albedo feedback mechanism, we would expect the ocean to be heating up, and that is in fact the case. So this figure here really just confirms what we're suspicious of, and that's that in this case, the linear sea surface temperature trend in degrees Celsius per year for August over the satellite data record where we have sea surface data from 1982 to 2020 is showing a warming in about 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 degrees Celsius per year. So there is a heat that's being deposited in the ocean because of the relative lack of sea ice and the ocean is getting warmer and warmer over time. Why are the measurements in August in this particular case? Well, you can see that a lot of that figure has a, has a white area in it, and that's where there's still sea ice. And what we're able to record here, of course, is the ocean temperature where there isn't sea ice. Sea ice is getting in the way. Even during the summer season in August, there is still sea ice there, so that's blocking our ability to measure how warm the ocean is. But we could assume that the ocean underneath the sea ice is quite warm and is contributing to the loss of sea ice that's taking place in the region as well. Warmer sea surface temperature, now we know that this is associated with more ocean heat storage, as I mentioned. That's also associated with more sea ice melt as heat is deposited in the, into the ocean and melts the ice that's sitting on top of it or is adjacent to it. We also know that that impedes the freeze up of sea ice during the fall season. So it's harder for the cold air in the atmosphere to actually create sea ice formation because the ocean is impeding that formation because it's warmer than what it used to be. We also know that there's a negative impact on the habitat of temperature dependent species. And we know that a lot of species in the Arctic are very sensitive to temperature so that a, a, a shift of, of even less than a degree Celsius can have a significant impact on habitats. And we do also know that the warming of the ocean in the Arctic is actually reducing the air ocean exchange of carbon dioxide. And that can be by as high as 50% according to a recent study by Dika Prande et al in 2020. Why is that the case? Well, it has to do with the gradient in between the air and ocean, uh, the air above the ocean and the ocean itself. And we call that the partial pressure of CO2 gradient. And we need a large gradient in order to promote ocean uptake of carbon dioxide. So very cold air over top of the ocean. Well, in this case, if we're closing that gap in the air, in the ocean and, and the atmosphere above it during the open water period, during the summer, in the Arctic, then we're seeing reduced air ocean exchange of CO2 and reduced carbon uptake. And the oceans are very important to us for uh, uptake in carbon because uh, we are putting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere and we do require some buffering by the oceans in order to mitigate carbon uptake because it is a greenhouse gas. Now there is also impacts on biology as well too. And in this particular case, it's a very fairly straightforward uh, mechanism that we see. Uh, where a loss of sea ice means a loss of what we call sea ice associated habitat. So our friend the polar bear here is a, is a sea ice associated species. Uh, the polar bear requires sea ice in order to hunt and travels on sea ice. So in areas where there's less sea ice during the summer season, there's more open water. That represents a loss of habitat and that species suffers as a result of it. Now it's more complex than that. The polar bear is uh, at the higher trophic level. Uh, but we can see impacts on lower trophic levels as well too. So in this case, phytoplankton and, and algae at the beginning of that food chain are also impacted by changes that are taking place in sea ice. So primary productivity. Now looking at Arctic primary productivity, Productivity can take place uh, in a sea ice environment, so we can actually have ice algae that, that is, is, um, is extracted from the sea ice by the melting process and interacts with sunlight and then creates a, a bloom in the water column. Or we can have um, a more straightforward bloom that takes place or primary productivity that takes place in the open water areas away from sea ice in the case of phytoplankton. In either case, that's the transformation of dissolved inorganic carbon into organic material through the photosynthesis process. 
And that provides a key ecosystem service because this is the bottom of the food chain, if you will. And that's highly seasonal in the Arctic. And what we see here is a simple mechanism where in the summer period, where we would have more productivity in the open ocean, well, if there's less sea ice there, then we see more open water and we actually see enhanced productivity. And this is something that can be monitored using satellite technology. Satellites are able to detect an algal pigment in chlorophyll called chlorophyll A, and that gives us a proxy for phytoplankton biomass. So the visualization that you see on the right side of this figure here is a visualization of the Salish Sea. It's a little bit closer to home. It's perhaps a little bit easier for us, or more intuitive for us for illustrative purposes to see in, in, the, in terms of looking at the imagery and the color of the imagery, it's intuitive that those bright green areas represent chlorophyll A and, and biomass that's being um, formed in, in the upper uh, ocean layer. So, in this case, there is actually a proxy there for what we see. This is a satellite image that collects information in the optical portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, so very similar to what our eyes are able to detect. And from that, we can model the phytoplankton biomass. Now, in the Arctic, we do see that rates of phytoplankton biomass have increased quite substantially. Uh, we have a consistent record from 1998 to 2018 that shows an increase of 57% in phytoplankton biomass. So much like other plots that we've shown here, or, or figures if you will, where we're looking down on the Earth's surface over the Arctic, we do see a blocked out area where the sea ice uh, generally is, and, and that's the case here in B, on the right hand side of this figure where the black area is where there's sea ice. What we're interested in are those areas around the sea ice where we can measure the primary productivity that's taking place. And we see that there's less sea ice in those areas. They're open now compared to conditions prior to the satellite era. And we can see that those areas of open water, if we understand them to be exposed to wind, which they would be, the wind promotes nutrient upwelling. So the absence of sea ice combined with nutrient upwelling is driving an increase in phytoplankton uh, biomass in the Arctic. Now I mentioned that we would look at tundra as well, adjacent to the ocean. So if you look at the figure on the left-hand portion of the screen there, again, we're looking down on the Arctic, so we can see North America on the left-hand side, Russia on the right-hand side. And there's a thin veneer, a thin strip of data, if you will, along uh, the coastal margins of the continuous land masses of each of those regions, Russia and North America. And what we're looking at is a change over time from 1982 to 2016, where we're asking the question, is the tundra getting greener during the growth season or is it getting browner? Is there more biomass there during the growth season or is there less? And we can either visualize it as we've done on the left-hand side or we can look at a time series as we've done on the right-hand side. And we see that from 1982 to 2016, there is generally a greening that's occurring in the Arctic in these, these two regions as it's been divided in this particular uh, study, the, the North American side and then the Russian side or Eurasian side, if you will. Now this is based on optical satellite data that gives us an idea of the amount of biomass based on an index uh, called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, NDVI. It's used quite commonly in, in a lot of contexts to understand how much biomass is in a given area in a given uh, point in time. And that's the case here and that's showing us that it is, it is greening quite considerably in the tundra adjacent to where the sea ice is declining. Now lastly, I'd like to talk about human risk in the Arctic, and it's important for us to recognize that the Arctic is an area uh, that, that's inhabited by people. There are in indigenous communities in the Arctic region. That's the case in Canada, in the US, and in Greenland, which uh, is, a, is, is part of, um, of Denmark, and all other regions of the Arctic as well there too, Russia, Finland, Norway, Sweden and Iceland. Now, in our case, we're interested in sea ice travel. We know that people use sea ice as a platform for travel, not just to get from point A to point B, but also to participate in subsistence activities like hunting and fishing as well, fishing through the ice or hunting by using the ice as a platform. Now, in the context of changing sea ice conditions, we know that there has to be an impact on sea ice travel and there is an impact on sea ice travel when sea ice conditions become more unpredictable compared to the way things used to be. 
Now what we're looking at, and this is research that's taking place in our lab here at University of Victoria, is using a technology called synthetic aperture radar, which is radar satellite technology. And if you look at this graphic here, this is a graphic that depicts a satellite from space. It's an active remote sensing technology, so it's actually transmitting its own energy towards the Earth's surface and then recording what comes back from the Earth's surface back to the satellite. And you can see there a grayish toned strip of, of information or data, if you will. And what that is, 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 is very much like what we would visualize from a SAR. And it's a, a gray toned and textured image that gives us some idea of the structure of the Earth's surface. So in this case, if we we're interested in the Arctic region and interested in sea ice, then we would be getting a, a visualization of ice structure. So a little bit on the radar technology here, we're transmitting a pulse of energy towards the Earth's surface and then measuring a return pulse called backscatter. And SARS transmit microwave energy, so unlike the passive microwave radiation case, here we're actually actively transmitting microwave energy towards the Earth's surface. So in a similar sense, we can form imagery regardless of whether there's daylight there in a particular region or, and regardless of whether there's cloud cover in a particular region. And that's excellent for Arctic conditions because it is dark for most of the year, and during the summertime when it is bright, it can still be quite cloudy in the region. Now, as I mentioned, the images are generally related to structure, and that's because we're, if you will, bouncing microwave energy off of surface features and then measuring what comes back to space. So if you have a flat surface, you would get very little energy back to the sensor, so it would appear very dark in an image. If it's uh, what we call diffuse, like a, a forested area, then we would see more energy bouncing back to the sensor and it would have a, let's, let's call that a medium brightness. And then if we have what's called a hard target, like a house or building, then we would see a bright return back to the sensor because most of the energy would come back uh, from where it was transmitted. So we have images like you see on the right hand side, which is actually a, a small image, if you will, in terms of it, its extent, it's 15 kilometers wide and 50 kilometers long, so a strip of, of data from a radar satellite or SAR. And in this case, the pixel size is down to the meter scale, so 2.75 meters. So one individual pixel element in that image, if we were to zoom into it, would cover an area of 2.75 by 2.75 meters. Now in this case, there is some color to the image, and we've added false colors to help visualize the scene. And those colors have been created by applying color to the backscatter that comes back to the sensor at a particular polarization, so horizontal polarization or vertical polarization. And that's because radiation always has a polarization associated with it. And we can filter out specific polarizations like horizontal and vertical. So this is very typical of a SAR image, and we're looking at a SAR image where the sea ice is, has a yellowish tone uh, with textured components that are related to the roughness of the ice and features on top of the ice like uh, ridges and, and uh, rough rubble-like areas. And there's a lot of fine scale detail. Now, unfortunately, this covers a very small area uh, compared to the data that we can get from passive microwave sensors where we're able to cover the entire Earth's surface uh, in one to two days. In this particular case, while well, we only have a swath that's uh, uh, you know, 15 kilometers wide, so it would be very difficult to cover the entire Earth's surface using 15 kilometer wide swaths. It takes several days to do that. However, there is a paradigm shift that's happening right now in SAR technology. And that's that we have now space agencies that are launching several satellites in a given mission that follow each other or track each other in orbit, if you will. And that increases the temporal frequency at which a SAR can cover a particular region of the Earth's surface. And because these are polar orbiting satellites, uh, we are able to form uh, an entire image of the Arctic's uh, ocean and land areas in a matter of one to two days. So the red tones on e in each one of these uh, figures here show the amount of coverage that you would get from a particular mission. So on the left hand side, the European Space Agency's Sentinel-1 SAR mission, and on the right hand side, the Canadian Radarsat Constellation mission, which was just launched last year. So in the Radarsat Constellation mission context, we're looking at northern Canada in that particular figure, and the red tone there actually tells us that we can get an image as high as four times a day in the Arctic region, despite the fact that the swath width of an 
individual acquisition is actually quite narrow. So it's the number of satellites passing over an area that allows us to fill in these pictures in terms of coverage. So we've asked the question in the context of sea ice travel to people that live in Western Canadian Arctic communities, what are the main sea ice features that you encounter now that impact safety and trafficability? How have these features changed over time and with season? And how can we perhaps use satellite remote sensing to improve the use of sea ice safety and trafficability for those communities? So we have a research strategy here and a project that we did from 2017 to 2019 with, as I mentioned, Western Canadian Arctic communities with a goal of having an applied output product as a result of that study. We held seven workshops, 37 sessions, and interviewed 47 formal interviewees and did a number of outreach activities in those communities. And that was work that was done um, quite substantially by a master's student, uh, Becky Siegel, in our ICE remote sensing lab here on University of Victoria. So I do give her credit for leading up this study and, and reaching that goal of an applied output product from the study. So the main outcome from that study was that we found that there is a desire to use SAR technology and imagery in order to obtain information about how rough the sea ice is. So that when people are using the sea ice for subsistence activities or to travel from point A to point B, typically on a snow machine, they're able to do that safely and not encounter rough features on the ice that would may, maybe cause them to have to deviate and find new routes. Anytime that you have to deviate or find a new route, that's a, a significant investment in time, and time is very precious when you're operating in a very extreme, cold and extreme environment like the Arctic. We found that the preferred roughness category is actually corresponded to local terminology as well too, meaning that we could take SAR imagery and we could find areas of smooth ice, moderately rough ice, and rough ice, and we could merge what we found in SAR images with uh, categories that actually corresponded to local terminology about ice so that we could take a map that we've created from a SAR image. So here we see that grayscale gray uh, tonal variation in, in the imagery. Uh, that's from the SAR image and then the brown in the map is actually just the land and where, where people are situated. In the right hand side of that particular map you would see the community of Cambridge Bay. And we can then take that image and we can actually map out the, the roughness of the ice in those three classes. So as we understand it, smooth ice, moderately rough ice, and rough ice, and people in communities can then take those maps and understand them in the context of the roughness categories that they're familiar with, so that when they plan uh, to travel, again, for hunting or just to travel from point A to point B, they can do so safely and they can actually use these maps for route planning as well too. Uh, the information has been very well received by communities uh, that we've worked with. So the three main communities that we've worked with in the Western Canadian Arctic in the Nunavut region. And we hope that we're able to extend that research to other communities as well. Now to summarize, we know that Arctic sea ice is declining in terms of it, its extent. So the area of the Arctic that, that it covers in a particular season or year and the most dramatic decline is happening during what we call the September minimum extent. So seasonally, when the ice reaches its minimum extent, we're seeing less and less ice each time it reaches that minimum sea ice extent in terms of a trend. There is some interannual variability, but the trend is very clear to us. We know that sea ice melt season is lengthening and that, that the ice is getting younger. We understand that if there's younger ice there, that means the ice is getting thinner, and, and that's because older ice is thicker than younger ice. We do infer the winter period ice thickness. We have a relatively short time series since 2003, and that reveals significant spatial and temporal variability. So not, a, not an overwhelming trend like we see with sea ice extent, but instead some decreases in some areas and some points in time, and some increases in some areas and some points in time. We know that the Arctic Ocean is heating up, and that has negative impacts on ice-associated species. It creates increased primary productivity. We're not certain if that's a good news story or a bad news story. Uh, certainly more pri primary productivity means more biomass, but we're not sure how those shifts in primary productivity and increases in primary productivity are impacting um, other species as well too. There's less carbon uptake that's taking place in the Arctic Ocean, um, and there's also more risks to humans who use the sea ice. 
Now, satellite remote sensing plays a special role in the study of the Arctic Ocean and adjacent land because it enables us to access an area that would be otherwise inaccessible to us. If you imagine a scenario where we had to go and physically sample something like the tundra or the sea ice over a large area, that would be very difficult to do without satellite remote sensing. We know that at the local to regional scale, the impact of climate change on ocean and biological systems and people is really only just beginning to be realized. So satellite remote sensing on the broad scale allows us to take a step back and look at the Arctic region. And from there, we can start to focus in on particular areas where there may be people or biological systems that, that we're trying to understand may be affected by things like climate change and hazardous ice conditions. We know that special technologies like SAR remote sensing will enable us to understand things like ice structural properties and help people adapt to climate change in the Arctic regions as well. Thank you.